So I just want to do a brief introduction before we uh, dive right into our panelists so you all know who they are. Um, we have two very esteemed panelists today. So the first on the far side is Lauren Oates. Lauren is TNC's Director of Policy and Government Relations where she develops, supports, and advocates for science-based policy solutions to our changing climate. In 2020, Lauren was appointed alongside Dr. Uh, Tupigi Jerome to the Vermont uh, Climate Council as a member with expertise in natural hazards resilience implementation. Prior to joining TNC, Lauren served as Vermont's state hazard mitigation officer, working with home and business owners, municipal, regional, state, and federal governments to develop plans and fund projects to reduce hazard vulnerability across Vermont. Particularly noteworthy for this conversation, uh, flooding actually brought Lauren to the month. She moved here following Tropical Storm Irene to assist the town of Waterbury with its long-term recovery planning efforts, and has continued in the climate adaptation and flood resilience realm ever since. So, welcome, Lauren. And uh, Dr. Leslie Ann dupigny an applied climate scientist by training, Dr. dupigny uh, research interests intersect a number of inter 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 interdisciplinary fields, including hydroclimatic, natural hazards, and climate literacy, geospatial climate, and land surface processes, all within the context of our changing climate. Dr. Dupiti Jiro has served as the Vermont State Climatologist since 1997 and is the immediate past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. In 2020, she was appointed by the Vermont House of Representatives to the Vermont Climate Council as the member with expertise in climate change science. She continues to work with Vermont state agencies and municipalities in their planning for and adapting to, changing, uh, to climate change. She is an expert in floods, droughts, and severe weather and the ways in which these affect Vermont's landscapes and people. She has worked extensively with K-12 teachers and students bringing the use of satellites, climatology, and climate change to all levels of the pre-university curriculum. She is the lead editor of Historical Climate Variability and Impacts in North America, the first monograph to deal with the use of documentary and other ancillary records for analyzing climate variability and change in the North American context. Nationally, in 2022, Dr. Pippi Giro was uh, nominated to serve a three-year term on the Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate in the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. She was invited by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Program to be the presenter on the Climate Change Leading the Way panel at the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, Scotland in 2021. She served as the lead author for the Northeast chapter of the 2018 Fourth National Climate Assessment of the U.S. Climate Change Research Program and is an author on the National Water Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. I was very deliberate, Lauren. I did do yours first. <laughs> um, so, just I just want to start off with a few questions for our panelists, and then we'd really like to open it up to the crowd. We have Suma over here uh, with a microphone, so we can start passing that around. Um, so, one of the one of the questions that I have when I watch something like this is uh, there seems to be a lot of focus on flooding disasters when people talk about the effects of climate change on Vermont. What are some of the other effects of climate change that we can anticipate in Vermont? And do you see anything having the disruptive or destructive effect to our daily life as the recent catastrophic floods have had? So, do you mind if I start with you? Sure. So, first of all, um, thank you to everybody for coming out on this cold and rainy uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, particular thanks to those of you who live in Montpelier. Um, I know there are a few of you here in the audience, and, and before I answer Tom's really long question, um, I just wanted to, to say my heart goes out to you. Um, I wasn't able to visit until about uh, a month ago, and just driving through Montpelier and uh, going to the State House, it was, it was really surreal. That's the only way I could come up with for that. Um, the humidifiers, dehumidifiers are still going, and I can only imagine what you're still going through as you drive through, as you look at your homes, as you look at your businesses. So for me, on a personal level, I just wanted to say, um, I just, my heart goes out. My, my heart really does go out. And in thinking about that, and thinking as a, a scientist, what are some of the other things that we are looking at um, in terms of our changing climate? Yes, floods are one of those pieces, and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about what does it mean to have a one in a hundred year event? 
possibly more than one time in a given year, what does that physically mean? But also remembering that just before the floods in July, we were dealing with drought conditions. And our farmers uh, were probably about to ask for a drought disaster declaration because of how severe that drought was. And it's not only this year, it's in previous years we've seen this. We're seeing how the, the ways that droughts are, are creeping up on us are actually changing. And so uh, that's one of the hazards that we're always looking at. And if you think back, even a few months before, we were dealing with frost conditions. And we know that our apple crop um, produce is actually severely affected by the frost that were taking place in the spring. And so as we think about what do we do as peoples in Vermont, and we think about all the various hazards, um, there, there are so many of them that are affecting different parts of the state differently. Um, one that did affect the entire state was wildfire smoke, right? And as a climatologist looking at, at these events sort of unfolding, and trying to make sure that we're looking at this from a system-wide perspective so that every hazard does not catch us by surprise, doesn't catch um, our economics, doesn't catch sectors by surprise, just making sure that we are, are trying to capture how these events are changing so that we know how to, to pre-stage and pre-plan for the next particular hazard that's coming down the pipe. Always hard to follow up after Leslie Ann. I have very little to add, although I'll put an asterisk, especially on the way that we do talk about flooding in this state. The images that we just saw, the drone footage, I am also a Montpelier resident and they are still striking to see uh, these three and a half months later, two and a half months later. Um, we think of flooding like that often as a species. We think of flooding as inundation style flooding where the rivers spill over their banks and they come up in a really vertical type of manner. Uh, in Vermont, actually, even though this is what we're talking about today and those are the images that we just saw, that's actually not our number one natural hazard. Our num number one natural hazard is fluvial erosion flooding. And that's the really violent, quick, extremely dangerous flooding that we see because of our steep topography and our very narrow river valleys. And that's what the majority of our flood damages, up to upwards 75, 80% of flood damages in Vermont typically come in that style. And then one more thing to consider, just the lasting impacts of how strange this year in particular has been, is that we're right next to Lake Champlain right now, which is at a pretty high level for this time of year. If you look at the hydrograph, you'll see it typically starts to really decline starting in July. Uh, and drops before we go into the, the winter months, which is actually really important because then the, when the lake levels lower, we're, it's able to receive a lot of the snow melt coming in March, April, May, and June of next year. And because it is so high now, if we have a really snowy season, which we love to have as Vermonters, uh, that will have huge implications, lasting implications on our lake shore here. So it's not over yet even. Uh, because of because of how much water we received after being in a drought, as you said. So the even flooding in Vermont, I want to say, is there are a lot of different types of hazards, hazards planning, and how we how we consider how we live along our waterways. And just to add one more piece, because uh, Lauren brought up that Lake Champlain, the amount of water that came down the Minnesota and made it to Lake Champlain was so much. We actually said two new records on, on, on Lake Champlain as a result of the, the July floods. So again, is it something that we're looking at because it's critically important as a kind of moves through it? See, there's a question. Yeah, do we have, were you saying it's just erosion when it's down slope or is there actually liquefaction here Yes, we also have quite a bit of landslide hazards in the state. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we, have a, we have a hydrologic problem uh, in the state that is multifaceted and depending on where you live, rurally, urban, upstate, downstate, it looks a little bit different in all of our towns. I mean, you're moderating, so I'm going to let you call up. Justin Duncan, before we take additional questions, I see a lot of familiar faces here, but some of you may be new to the Nature Conservancy and maybe just talk to him as your loyal supporter of ATIP. Tom, do you want to um, just really quickly speak to, really quickly speak to someone? Really it is. It is. Yeah. You guys talk about the question. Oh, okay. Um, who we are, what we do at the Nature Conservancy? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you for that introduction. I was so excited to introduce our panelists. I forgot to introduce ourselves as the Nature Conservancy. Yes. So the Nature Conservancy is a global organization. We're actually the largest global conservation organization in the world. We currently exist in 77 countries, and in all 50 states, we have chapters. Um, in Vermont here, we have protected uh, 300,000 acres of lands and waters in Vermont. Um, and 90% of that has been turned over, actually, to public lands. So a lot of the um, state wildlife management areas, state uh, forests, things like that, that you all know and love, Camel Stump, Green River Reservoir, Gucci Gorge, a lot of those were originally protected by the Nature Conservancy. And we are, as we evolve, are in so many different realms now, not just in direct land and water protection, but we also uh, work closely in our policy work. And Lauren's gonna be talking today, um, working with our legislators to really uh, compose robust legislation that can really help protect uh, nature here in Vermont. And I also want to introduce just a few people here that are with us today. We have uh, a couple of our board members, an advisory council member. So we have um, Lucy Lehman, who is on our advisory council there, and Beverly Whipple, and uh, Linda McGinnis, who are both on our board. And I hope I'm not missing anybody else that popped in at the last minute. Oh, yes, and Brenda Bergman, Dr. Brenda Bergman, who is our um, director of science and freshwater, is here. She did pop in the last minute, so I did miss someone. So she works uh, among our staff at the Nature Conservancy. Um, so, I just want to, before I turn it over to more audience questions, I just want to ask one more question myself of you all, which is, you know, uh, the bike shop owner there mentioned the 1927 flood. And it's something that I've always kind of wondered about the context of the 1927 flood. Um, I assume no one in the audience was around for that one, but I'm sure many of you were around for the 1992 flood in Montpelier that hit Montpelier in particular really hard and, and was, from my understanding, not dissimilar to what we saw in the video today. And then there was, in 2011, Tropical Storm Irene, which was less devastating, per se, to Montpelier than maybe water barriers to other communities, and now these new floods. Can you talk a little bit, kind of, about some of these patterns that we're seeing in, in these floods? And in particular, what was different about the 1927 flood, and do we have any of those same conditions that are set up today? So the 1927 flood um, is what we call a flood of record. Um, and it stayed like that until um, Irene came in, in 2011. And Irene was really concentrated in the southern part of the state. And so that eight plus inches that we saw in Irene actually um, set up the flood of, condition, flood of record conditions for the south, but the 1927 flood still remains for the north. And the 1927 flood was interesting because it occurred in a year that was a drought year, and then we received like 200% of the November rainfall in two days. And so we went from drought to this massive amount of, of flooding as a result of how much rain fell in a short period of time. So it starts to sound familiar with what happened this year as well. And I think one of the things that is, is important to remember is not how frequently it occurs only, but how much rain actually fell and how quickly that got into the lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. So, when you hear that 100-year event and you hear folks say, oh, but we had a 100-year event in my lifetime, it's not going to happen again, I think the, the understanding needs to shift a little bit that the one in a 100-year event is an actual amount of rain that falls. And so let's say it's 8.2 inches, right? So if 8.2 inches fell today, and that considers a one in a 100-year event, if two weeks from now 10 inches falls, then that's a, that also exceeds that one in a hundred year event. So calling it the hundred year storm is a little bit of a misnomer because it, it makes us think as humans that it can't happen again. When if we shifted that to uh, if a certain amount of rain falls and it's large enough and it falls quickly enough and it's concentrated enough, then yes, you will get flooded. Again, going after you. Maybe I should always start with Lauren. No, I think the only thing that I'll add to that is actually, since we're referencing back to the video, one of the notes in the video said, when these business owners are considering whether or not they want to rebuild, rebuild in kind, change the way or place that they are going to rebuild, it said, you know, especially in a place that might flood again, and I would just say, again, as a Montpelier resident, as a Vermont resident, it will flood again. That is something that we all have to really come to terms with. 
and 100 year flood is a misnomer. It's easier to really understand, especially for statistically challenged people, potentially like myself, when we say the 1% annual chance flood, that's just, it feels very academic and isn't necessarily accessible to the general public, so we really need to figure out a better way to communicate what the true risk uh, is to flooding in our communities. But yeah, I would change that little piece that say to in a place that will flood again, because not really it will flood again. Linda, before I get to you, can I just, I'll, I'll ask you a question next, but I, I lied before when I said I'm going to open up the question because I have been so curious about some of these things myself and I've directed my questions to Leslie and that I have a question that I want to ask Lauren and then I'll, and then I'll get right to you, Lauren, or, uh, Linda, which is, um, so what next, what do we do about this and what are some of the things, especially from a policy perspective, what are some of the changes that we can make? I'm so sorry if that was your question. <laughs> what are some of the changes that we can make and what are some of the things that the Nature Conservancy is advocating for so that we can both kind of use nature to adapt to our new climate reality, but hopefully start to steer the course of our new climate reality. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Let's see, Anna, you sure you don't want to talk about policy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good question, and it kind of takes coming off of your question for Leslie Ann, which was focused on what we have learned from the past, uh, from the 1927 flood, from the 1992 flood, from Tropical Storm Irene. So much of what we experienced during those floods should and must inform how we're going to experience the next floods as a state. I mentioned that different towns have different types of flooding. So how those towns choose to plan for, develop, and respond to disasters, especially flooding, will look different. And yet, there are things that we know that we could and should be doing differently. We inherited, all of us in this room here today, we've inherited Vermont's historic settlement pattern of close-knit communities, largely uh, very close and snug to our rivers, which on drier <laughs> and drier seasons, uh, and drier years, is actually really quaint. It's part of the bucolic nature of Vermont that generally feels really great to be so close to our water. It keeps us connected uh, to nature. It keeps us connected to one another. However, because of the way we built and because of how closely we built, we're going to continue to have these disasters. So looking forward, we need to think differently about where and how we develop. We know there are places like Montpelier that have any, 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 you all know as Montpelier residents right next to me, any road you take, within a mile and a half, you're gonna start climbing up a steep hill. And we just, all of that water catches in downtown Montpelier. That's different than other, other towns in the state. We all have uh, a different topography uh, and different relationship to where the nearest hill is. But we do know that there are places where we have an opportunity to allow our rivers to slow down and store their waters both before and after they hit our communities. And so we need to find places where we can reconnect our rivers to our floodplains. 75% of Vermont's MAC rivers are actually disconnected from their floodplains. And what that means is all that water is getting forced into hyper-managed and very fast, quick, dangerous water conditions. They don't have access to their floodplains where they naturally spill out and release their energy. Our villages are often our floodplains. And so in the future, we need to find those areas that we have not yet developed and protect them from development. Not only so the people who would otherwise inherit those problems that we created for them don't, but so that we have those spaces to store water and protect our existing downtowns and villages. Um, we are, as TNC, um, other advocates, uh, we have great representation within our Vermont legislature. They are now have a mandate because of these floods truly to reconsider our land use patterns and policies. And so we'll be working on making sure that those areas of, of highest value for river and flood vulnerability will be protected in the future. And, and the only thing I'd add is um, that we to consider this on a watershed perspective. I see my colleague, um, Beverly Wunkel here, um, who works primarily on a watershed scale. And when we think of, like, on a watershed scale, the things that we do are going to affect uh, folks downstream, and we would like folks upstream to be also thinking of us. And so one of our, our joint colleagues always says, do unto the folks downstream as you would have the folks upstream do unto you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, Linda Blair? Linda. Yeah, I mean, the, your question was what I, I wanted to ask, but I can go a little further than that and ask you to give a couple of examples of where those watersheds have been protected and what happened in this flood, just to give an example of a positive action that we'd like to have a lot more of. And then to just give a shout out to what are some of the policies um, and things that we need to be talking to our about going Thank you, Linda. Um, I have two great examples in different parts of the state. First, many of you have um, maybe heard of how well Middlebury fared during Tropical Storm Irene. Middlebury was one of those places that, it, you know, downstream in, a, in Addison County, which was severely impacted, they did pretty well, even though they are close to the Otter Creek, and that's because prior to Irene, they invested as a town, as a community, in doing quite a bit of restoration work and protection work for their Otter Creek swamps and floodplain. And a student whose name is escaping me, and maybe Beverly or Leslie Ann can remember, uh, at UVM did a study to understand what was the, the lost value add. What did, they, what did Middlebury, because they did that proactive work, actually avoid in damages? And she had found through doing that work that the businesses, businesses alone in Middlebury actually avoided $1.8 billion in damages. Or, is that right, Mike? That's right. Yes, okay. Uh, and that doesn't include public infrastructure damages, which are incredibly expensive. It didn't include damages to private homes. Um, and you heard a, a couple of the business owners talking about how cost prohibitive flood insurance is for FEMA. So, um, Middlebury is a really positive success story for figuring out places to store and protect uh, natural spaces that act as sponges uh, while protecting their development downtown. As is Brattleboro, who's a more recent example. Uh, they have invested, it's a pretty densely packed, uh, which is unlike a lot of places in Vermont, um, area, and they still were able to find along the highly erosive Whetstone Brook a couple of places for floodplain restoration and reconnection. They moved out uh, of the Melrose Terrace community, which was a community of five or six buildings and over 100 residents uh, who are 55 plus uh, in a really dangerous area that experienced repetitive flooding. They moved them out to higher and drier land and used that past area to drop the floodplain and allow more of the waters to store there, and they found a spot just downstream to do the same. And they found that, you know, the engineers who worked on those two projects together have found that those two projects are going to reduce flooding in downtown Brattleboro by six to 12 inches during future flood events. Um, so non-trivial, there are places that we can do these types of projects elsewhere in the state that would have significant implications on not only reducing flood, but also reducing the need to move people out of where they currently live, where they created their communities. Why don't I go to her first? Yeah. Yeah. Then I'll get to you next, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear your expertise. Thank you. I have two interrelated questions. One is the farming community I've been getting to know for, and uh, their distress this exact uh, incident now, how are they going to look to the future? And then with the extent of the runoff that came down the Lucy into the flood in Champlain, how is that going to affect our water quality in the future? I'm not talking about E. coli. That's what they measure here. But I want to know about the more general questions of phosphorus loading and all those other questions. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Those are good questions. I'll answer them to the best of my knowledge. Um, first, by saying one of uh, Leslie Ann and my colleague on the Vermont Climate Council is a farmer, and the three of us have worked very closely on trying to help develop policies and plans and just creating more conversation around the impacts that our agricultural community is going to face. A lot of our floodplains and river corridors are in agriculture and a lot of our prime agricultural soils are also in our floodplains because that's where historically we have 
deposition and nutrient turnover, which is actually long term very healthy for crop management, but in those flood years is really meaningful and detrimental. And because of other policies that I do not work on but support, um, that really try to protect and keep businesses that are in agriculture afloat in these trying times. Um, our farmers are really living on the edge. They live day to day uh, to keep their livelihood. And this, this flood and floods that they've experienced in the recent couple of decades have been really devastating to them. We need to figure out places uh, where, they can, where they can continue to, to graze cows or grow vegetables, but they also need to be investing in, um, in both durable but also sustainable approaches to how they're managing their land, to making sure that they have a diversification of crops. As I mentioned earlier, a late freeze in May that devastated apple crops across the state, and just making sure that we're empowering them and supporting them because in a, in, China, in, in a changing climate, we need to make sure that we're also getting a lot of our food more locally and that we aren't bringing out a lot from Mexico or Florida or California. Uh, so policies to support that will be really important in a changing climate. And your second question, I'm forgetting, just give me like two Nutrient problems. loading. Nutrient uh, loading, uh, yes. Uh, well. Well. <laughs> Well, from a policy perspective, you just really served it up. Thank you. Uh, so Lake Champlain has a TMDL, which is a total maximum daily load plan for phosphorus runoff into the, into the lake. And that plan has a, a whole bunch of actions, uh, policy mechanisms, et cetera, that can be taken. And the number one policy mechanism to reduce phosphorus loading in Lake Champlain, and therefore allow the state to meet its EPA Environmental Protection Agency's required minimum, or maximum rather, daily loading, is to protect our river corridors from development. And so and there's... Does that include farming that's going through both of you at the same time? It does. Yeah. It does, and there is, there is a difference between building our hardened infrastructure, undersized culverts, undersized bridge, homes, propane tanks, et cetera, et cetera, than a field that isn't well buffered and not managed and you implicate tile drains and I'm starting to lean into a space that I know a lot less about. I know other people in the audience might, so if anybody wants to jump in on agriculture, please feel free to. Um, but yes, there, we need to look at our river corridors and, and as you said, whole, whole watersheds when we're thinking about nutrient runoff and how it eventually makes it to the lake. But what the, do you know what the water quality you want to talk about Saginaw bacteria? I was going to talk to, to, to Mike, Beverly, or Mike, or... Because yeah, they're sitting out there. We've got a lot of experts in this field. Yeah, it's well, on. Yeah. It's on you this quiet. Put it very close. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm Beverly Lear. I'm the Director of Water Quality Research Center at the University of Michigan. And I'm really interested in the water quality space. We know that when we get these big events, there's a long-term legacy that can last for hundreds of years. Um, with sediments, nutrient laden sediments in the bottom of the lake that will then up well. I will also say that maybe a silver lining is in about 2018, the basin program, the Lake Champlain Basin program funded a study at UBM to quantify the depositional benefits of connected floodplains. And we have a study that has sites across the entire Lake Champlain Basin that we've been lucky enough to get flood events and see the quantity of material that's actually deposited on those floodplains during floods, and it's quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of what's motivating us, and the former director of our rivers program in Vermont is sitting right in front of me, mm -hmm. um, and Mike really pioneered this work of, let's give our rivers room to move, and let's take advantage of this natural infrastructure for both the flood mitigation impact, but also the water quality benefits and we have real data that shows that that works. Like I said, we can track a lot of material on these connected floodplains and mitigate those downstream impacts in multiple ways. I have a question right there. I just wanted to just uh, ask Mike very quickly if there's anything you wanted to add. As Beverly mentioned, he's been the director of our research program for formerly recently retired uh, for years to possibly decades. Yes. But 
<coughs> Thank you. Um, I think the, you know, the good news is some of the same things that we're talking about um, in terms of actions to make our communities more resilient to flood and erosion hazards are the same actions that are going to help us um, reduce the loading of, of nutrients in Lake Champlain. They're co-benefits that work hand in hand uh, and in well with each other. <coughs> the key word is storage. Um, I think it was, it was mentioned a couple of times here that uh, Many things have happened in our watersheds to reduce the amount of storage of both water and sediment. And <clears throat> it does mean giving up some room for the river, both in the urban setting and the agricultural setting, um, in hopes that by doing so, we reduce the energy of the river, we give the river a place to spread out, uh, the plant life on those river corridors and floodplains can absorb sediments and nutrients, and then the lands that are outside of these river corridors, but yet still in our valleys, might be accessible for uh, our other community needs, including farming. So that's some of the policy goals that we've been pers we pursued uh, with our partners in the Rivers Program. And um, I think uh, the, the water quality work that we've done has been uh, part and parcel with our efforts to reduce flood damages. Thank you. And so I've got two, two people waiting very patient. I'll go with you and then I'll do your next. Sorry. Uh, can we stick to the center and then I'll switch? Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. My apologies for yeah, This is pretty short, too, for me statistically challenged. Um, I believe it means that this coming year is just as likely to flood as it was to happen this year. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it occurred doesn't mean now you have another 100 years till it happens again. Every single year is just as likely, and that's before you account for any climate change. Um, so, yeah, it's just going to multiply, and at least in other states, FEMA is notorious for having poor flood maps. Uh, the First Street Foundation, I believe, and Risk Factor have developed some further information that's more accurate. I don't think it has anything from runoff, but hopefully you guys are also working with them to see your maps and your mitigation strategies. Thank you. Thank you for waiting patiently, so we've got a question up there. <coughs> oh, thank you. I very much appreciate what you're saying about the, the watershed and the floodplains and the significance of doing the work in those areas, but I'm also curious about the built environment, for example, in Montpelier. They've had this history of flooding there. And what steps have they taken in advance of this latest flood to make some changes to the built environment in order to make the built environment more resilient to the flooding? I understand that um, the transportation center um, worked fairly well. The new transportation center and down, downstreet housing did as well. I'm just wondering what things you've seen that are really working for the built environment. So for, for Montpelier, a couple of things have happened um, since the 1927 flood, which was very devastating for the town. Uh, first was actually the development of the Wrightsville Reservoir uh, through a very massive dam that was built there. There are all sorts of implications to uh, dams and how they change our river systems in the state, how they change aquatic habitat. Um, there are a lot of implications to dams, but that, that dam was built primarily as a flood retention mechanism. It nearly was breached, which I want to say there was a miscommunication about that. That does not mean the dam was going to fail in July. It just means it was performing as it should and holding back as much water as it could before a spillway would have been used, which would have exacerbated flooding in downtown, but would not have been catastrophic as a dam breach would have been. So a dam was built. And that was one of the reasons why Irene Mockelier did okay. Um, but beyond that, it's really about what we're doing in the future for flood inundation especially. We have opportunities to, uh, you mentioned the transportation center, uh, which is right on our river in downtown Mockelier too. But they built 
and they elevated it to where their first floor and livable space was. So the first floor is really, you know, the transportation where buses come in. Uh, you can build in things like flood proofing, like flood vents that allow river, that, that allow flood waters to actually flow through and under, almost like a crawl space, and, and you, you allow the property to flood, essentially. There are safe ways to do that, that reduce hydrostatic pressure, too. Uh, so you don't have to worry about structural integrity in any buildings. Uh, I, I think and hope that a lot of businesses downtown realize not to store much of anything in their basements now, because uh, basements will continue to flood um, even if first floors don't. So it's it, while a convenient space to, to house things, uh, you should not put your utilities down below the floodplain. Uh, and those, those are small things, small elevation flood proofing that can be done. Uh, and those are things that when we consider uh, places like Waterbury, which is also largely a town that's impacted by that inundation style flooding, that's what they've done. They've invested in some home elevations, uh, so the homes have been built at a higher grade and therefore can withstand future flood damages. Uh, beyond that, there are places that are kind of um, regularly damaged. You know, the first floor is several feet below the floodplain. Um, that might be cost prohibitive to do, you know, flood elevations, and that's there's an opportunity for a buy out there where you can purchase the home, demolish it, and allow that space to just be floodplain in the future. Um, we can't do that at mass scale. I think we probably have something like 10,000 buyouts that we would really need to do across the state, and we already have a housing crisis. So where will those 10,000 families move? Um, so we really need to look at uh, different opportunities for storing floodplains, or storing floodwaters, slowing floodwaters, so that those areas that are already built can be protected. Thank you. And were you able to attend any of the three different um, sessions in Montpelier? Do you live in Montpelier? I'm just curious. No, I don't sure. Okay. There were three sessions in, in Montpelier where the residents got together to actually, um, I think the first session was a, a, a grieving session. The second session was, okay, let's roll out the seeds and see what we can talk about. And then the third session was, let's get some solutions on the table. And it was interesting to hear a lot of um, ideas put forth, like, should we move to high school, for example? Right? It's smack in the middle of, of the floodplain itself. Should it not even be there? And then another interesting suggestion was, let's learn from other places that are either below sea level, that have done creative things to, to manage water, or have been flooded in the past, and have sort of learned from that. So I think now is a sort of critical time to really get all of these ideas on the table to make some really, really hard decisions. Do you have questions over here? Yeah. I don't know who was first. I'm just gonna go first. Um, I don't live in Vermont, but um, what we see uh, around the country is that a lot of these kind of climate crisis events are impacting marginalized and minoritized communities um, way more than everybody else. You know, they're, they're impacted most and harmed the most when a crisis happens. They're less able to rebuild and then less able to invest in the future and kind of future proof. So I'm just curious, locally here, what kind of examples of those disparities have you seen and what kind of policy solutions are there? So I, I was able to um, give some testimony at the Senate um, Economics committee um, two days ago, and that sort of came up as one of the things that we need to be put in front of the center, because this is October, so it's of October, we're getting into winter, and um, we have a, a large population of unhoused or um, housing insecure members of our population, and I think um, when we think about some of the peoples who are, are marginalized on the front end, front line, are vulnerable, I think now is the time to actually really think about what the strategies we need, and some some are more immediate than others, right? But all are critically important. I really appreciate the question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, two discrete examples. First, hearing Leslie Ann say as an all hazards approach, I'll, I'll back it out from flooding and say that the Vermont Health Department has done a lot of work around the public health impacts of climate change in Vermont. And actually, I found that there are other hazards that we're experiencing, and it might be surprising, maybe especially as a non-Vermonter, but for Vermonters too, to hear that one of our um, most problematic to vulnerable population hazard is prolonged heat events. 
So it's actually not that like, whoa, we had a random day where it was 95 degrees and it was really hot. It's we had a week and a half that never got below, you know, 78 at night and was topping over 90. And those prolonged heat events have a significant um, demonstrable impact on ER or emergency department visits, especially for our elderly population. We are the first or second oldest state in the country. Uh, so that is that is a disadvantaged group, a vulnerable group to that climate hazard. And the other, to bring it back to flooding, a discrete example, you're right, especially the financial, financially vulnerable Vermonters among us. We have 12% of our mobile home Mobile homes and mobile home parks are located in our floodplains and river corridors, and only 4% of our single family homes are. It's a three fold increase uh, in the vulnerability that that um, demographic experiences in Vermont, which is really troubling, not only because, well, actually, for exactly the reasons you said, they're the least financially and socially able to um, prepare for, respond to, and recover from. Events. So, looking at how we work with those home, mobile home parks, especially, um, and the dynamic that's really hard often, which is mobile home parks themselves, the land is owned by, you know, a mobile home park owner, but the structures that are on them are owned by individual property owners, and that creates a huge, uh, really problematic and really unfortunate bureaucratic problem in accessing a lot of federal funds, um, and that's a problem that um, Central Vermont Office of Economic Opportunity has been working on quite a bit to figure out how to reduce um, the vulnerability of those groups and make sure that the policies that we advocate for really consider them first and foremost. Does anybody in the room know if we have a hard stop at 2 because it's 158? Is there another movie showing 2? 215? Okay, let's, let's push it a little bit then. Brenda, why don't you go ahead and ask a question? Or, or to yeah, thank you. Thanks for all these good questions and wonderful responses. I just wanted to contribute a little to the point about putting solutions on the table and a lot of the dialogue around how are we looking forward to where and how our towns are developing into the future. One of the things that Mr. Klein has contributed to our thinking around is how and where we help our individual municipalities and towns make those decisions. And right now, as you know, it's really in their hands to decide how we develop within what we're calling our river corridors or that area where the river likes to move. So one of the things that we've been working on together with the Vermont DEC is to say, let's, let's help municipalities figure out this mapping to say, where is it safe and where is it really going to be hazardous and difficult for our communities to rebuild? And let's put that into some more robust maps that then can be used for zoning and land use planning. And also let's help municipalities who currently have the authority to decide whether or not they're going to adopt regulations to protect those river corridors to do so. This is another equity issue in that um, municipalities that don't have the staff or the money or the time or the expertise to work on this, their communities can be disadvantaged because of that. Um, so while we're working at a state level to say how can we support statewide some of these decisions, let's also reach out and engage with our municipalities. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, feel free to reach out to us as well. And I wanted just to say one more thing about the dams. So thank you for the comment about the dam. I just want to remind us ourselves that we only have a handful of dams in our state that are actually flood water retention dams, very, very tiny fraction of our nearly 1,000 dams in the state. And so, and many of the dams that are in the state are actually at risk of causing more flooding and damage during heavy rains because they have not been updated or they need repairs. Um, Vermont Dam Safety has recently gone around and looked at all of that and found many that, um, that we need to look at. So it's just important to bear in mind that not all dams are here for helping us to, to, to be safe from floods, and we need to um, advocate for the ones that are helping us and also work on removing the ones that are cause, co causing <coughs> risks. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. I'm so glad you clarified that. So with that, uh, it looks like we are ready to turn this room over, so I just want to thank everybody so much, especially our panelists. Uh, oh, Lauren's going to say one more super quick thing. Very quick. My mom would be so proud of me for doing this. I have a cutout from seven days that I really wanted to read. Uh,
just to tie back to the video before we turn over, the very end, the, the business owner mentioned that we're living at war with our river. And that's how we have treated our river historically, and the only way we're going to change our flood vulnerability together as a community of communities is to live with our river and not against it. And I'm really uh, heartened by this poem from a 13-year-old that I'm just going to read very quickly uh, that shows that we are we are changing as a species and how we live. The river speaks. There is a web and it holds us. Pieces come apart, so we help rebuild it. We are a species that has forgotten our place on the web, so the earth reminds us. It shows us that there are some lines that we do not cross, and if we do cross them, the water rises, pushing us back. The water comes back, and it takes. It's the destruction of what we've built, but also the reconstruction of the natural world. The water roars, it cries, and it heals, even when we feel hurt. That's Ursa Goldenrose from Hardaway, because she's 13, which is just so inspiring. I think we can say that we can talk about it, so I'm going to write that and thank you all.